And so how far can I move? Rodrigo? Say right there. Okay. Yeah, now why can't I get close? I need to actually come close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, okay, okay. I like that. Can you hear me? <laughs> That's good. And the feedback right there? Oh, this is good. I like this. Good morning, church. How y'all doing? Why do you guys feel so spread out? <laughs> Why are y'all trying to hide from the sun? Ah, y'all got that devil on top of me. I got that, yeah. <laughs> okay, that was a black future joke. All right, amen. I'll take that. I'll take that. Well, it's good to see everyone. Um, I do feel a little distant, but I respect that. I mean, I was hiding in the sun too, so I get it. I get it. I had to work with this. I understand. I can, but I'm just worried about the camera. We got Zoom. Today, so we got the Zoom people. Good morning, Zoom. <laughs> so, we are going back, examining Steve. We've been at Stephen for a, how long now? <laughs> Dissecting the life of Stephen, there's a lot to be gained. And I just want to uh, give a thanks to Koya for stepping in last week. Thank you. So, round of applause for the step in. Uh, and continue, Stephen, to held, held, held back to it. But God, brothers and sisters, this is the final week we'll be examining some life lessons from the life of Stephen. We have two things that we're going to pull out, but I believe that these two points are actually some of the most important points that I want to really highlight for us. As we shared before, we go into our discussion groups and, and have a time of conversation. I shared that the thing that I think is unique about Stephen is what? Does anyone remember this one character? There's something I think is super unique and why I want to spend so much time examining his life. Anyone remember? Yes, he was an ordinary, he wasn't an apostle. He was an ordinary disciple. And I think sometimes when we read through the book of Acts, we get, we separate Look at the apostles. Look at the disciples did. And we kind of don't acknowledge that you didn't have to physically walk with Jesus to do incredible things. And in today's message, I think we're going to really highlight some of those points. Uh, and it's going to echo a lot that we talked about earlier uh, in the book of Acts. And we talked about miracles. And we talked about the supernatural power and movement of the Holy Spirit. And... I'm going to talk about some things that are very poignant to what we're dealing with in today's society, uh, in culture. So, y'all ready to go? Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for today. Opportunity to examine your word, to be inspired by your word, to even be challenged by your word. Uh, I know there's a lot going on in our society today, a lot going on politically. A lot going on financially and socially. So many things to distract us from making the most of this time. But I pray that we separate all of that and acknowledge the fact that we are here. And we give this time the respect it deserves. Because we know that everything else is going to demand our time and attention once we leave here. So I pray that we use this as a meditative state to reflect on you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the final three things that I want to pull from the point of examining the life of an ordinary disciple in the book of Acts. The third point is this. God does his greatest work through ordinary people. God does his greatest work through ordinary people. Man, I feel like I'm in a stadium. The reverb is serious. Y'all hear that? Okay, it's not just me. Okay. <laughs> You know, I made the point earlier on that Stephen in the book of Acts here, we're in Acts uh, 6 and 7. Stephen preaches a longest sermon recorded in the book of Acts. Koya went into detail into that sermon, kind of went in breaking some of these different points down. But what I think is really powerful about this sermon is that this sermon leads to the conversion of Saul. 
And this is important because it shows that ordinary people filled with the spirit can do everything that an apostle can do. You know, this example comes full circle when Jesus gives this challenge. And I want y'all to kind of hone in on this challenge in John 16. Jesus says something that I think that even we would question. Do we even believe this statement? In John 16, verse 7, Jesus says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go away, and if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the, to the world. He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people did not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Jesus literally said that it's better for me to go in order for people to believe in me. Do y'all believe that? Show of hands, how many people believe, like, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Now, how many of us would actually say, actually, Jesus, if you were here in the flesh, I think people would easily believe in you. You can't have both, Brian. That, ain't, that wasn't a quite, that wasn't an option. That was an option. <laughs> No, but I understand. I understand the sentiment. But think about this, right? To me, this is a very absurd statement if you just think of it from a fleshly perspective. Jesus, you're literally saying that, man, you being gone makes it easier for people to have faith in you, makes it easier for people to be convicted by their sin. How does that make sense? What do y'all think about that statement? No, I'm asking. I'm asking. What do y'all think about? That? Say a little bit last song. Mm. Treat them the same way. Okay. Huh? Oh, that that oh, mic that, that thing. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I remember. The... Appreciate, appreciate it. Watch out! Watch out for the chords. Got me last time. <laughs> All right. Anyone All right, else? Anyone else? People were so looking for, like, you know, everything, everything on, like, mm -hmm. that's a good point. That's a good, good point. point. Good point. Good point. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Just so y'all know, just so y'all know, today is Nobi's first day on staff here. Just want to make sure. Make sure. I think I think I also agree, but I would also I would say that Jesus Brown there was the most unhealthy alliance saying faith when it came to right, mm -hmm. right? Like, like people, people wouldn't the believe that they had, but like God would give them the power to do the same works that Jesus was doing, unless oh, Jesus right. left, because right? Everybody because be everybody would be waiting on Jesus. Proved already, proved already before that he can do his so, so why look at why look at anybody else to do so? Especially not myself, because I think. Speaking personally, speaking personally, I, I, I can disqualify myself very easily and always give it over to the person, to the person who looks more qualified in the room. Mm. So if Jesus is around me, I, I'm not going to ask to do the miracle and be like, go ahead, Jesus, you do it. <laughs> right? But like, yeah. if if Jesus leaves and, and therefore empowers me as the intercessor to be able to be guided by the spirit, then it's really, who, who else can I look to? Right? It's just me and God at that point. You know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Great point. Great point. I think um, I'm actually it's similar to what Novi shared. I thought my thought is that 
with the helper, in some ways, Jesus is multiplied. And it's not just him, but it's his spirit being given to so many others who will be able to do, follow his example. So I feel like through that, we are able to see many more miracles and a lot more done. No, that's, that's awesome. Awesome. Amen. Anyone else? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Go ahead, Rachel. Rachel's on this side. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. There's two Rachels. Oh, Sorry, there's two Rachels. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rachel. I'm sorry, Rachel. <laughs> I mean, I really can't ask her, but That's awesome. That's awesome. And oh, I'll let, oh, I got to let go ahead and let. <laughs> you know, if it was Kenny, I would have let him share. But it's Lane. You. <laughs> got you. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 So, just the thought that um, something that really challenges me is to to really have enough courage to speak up for the person who's not in the room. Mm. And I think that's the test that Jesus, you know, we know he's always present, but we can't see him. And that's the point mm. that he's still in the room. Mm. And when people are having conversations about him, I think that's a real test to our courage. Like mm. Stephen, it really tests our courage. Mm. No, that is that's great. That, okay, that's my sermon, guys. Thanks so much. I don't think I need to add on to any of that. I I really pray y'all heard those responses because that that says something to all of us. You know, it would be fantastic to have Jesus in our ministry, right? You know, we just added a new staff member here at Mercer. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had Jesus on staff? Like, <laughs> what? What? We, you know, we had Jesus on the staff. You know. The, the, co the coffee runs out, you know what I mean? It gets multiplied, and it's the good stuff, you know? Dre does a great job with the coffee, Dre. We love it. You know, Dre, you know, give Dre a round of applause. He does a great job with that coffee table. And that but if Jesus was doing it, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It'd be a little different. We'd have cold brew. You know what I mean? We'd have a nice cold brew in the summer. You know what I mean? Like, that would be awesome, you know? The difficult questions, damn. We got someone to answer them, and we got some questions, right? We got some difficult questions in society in the time we live in. Jesus has the answer for it. The dog gets hit by a car. Jesus resurrects it. You know what I mean? The cat gets hit. Jesus prays for it. You know, like, that's not just playing my bias in the sorry. <laughs> Preaching would be awesome. You know, like, we'd have the, we'd have the greatest preacher ever. goal what's the goal what's the goal of church why are we here why do we show up every Sunday for this time even with all how awesome we could imagine what it would be like to have Jesus here he said the power of the Holy Spirit at work in ordinary believers would be the would be greater than the physical presence of Jesus being here on earth. Wow. That is that is a profound statement. 
And it, it, it exemplifies something that, again, I think we overlook too easily. I think we overlook it too easily. And we see this lived out in, in Stephen's life. And I think it's uh, now, here we go. We're going to talk about some stuff. How we have built our churches turns this sentiment on its head. Right? How we put together churches is really actually messed up, I think, what Jesus intended. This could sound odd coming from a preacher, but when I'm really examining this, I, I really do feel it's challenges how, why we don't see all the incredible things we see in Acts today. You know, we have built churches as a group of people who come to admire a leader. That's what we've done. We built churches as a group of people to come and admire one leader, one set of gifts, right? And to put that on a pedestal. And I think that keeps us from tapping into the real potential of the church. It keeps us from tapping into the true potential of the church. The greatest miracles were supposed to happen through you. Not through me. Not through a leader. The greatest miracles are supposed to happen through you. And what does that mean? Watch out for the cord, y'all. Them Zoom people are going to be upset. <laughs> and I think that's important for us to ask and, and examine. Like I said, who got converted because of this sermon? Saul. Well, it's part of the process, right? Saul. The Sauls of our community probably won't be converted because I'm preaching. The Sauls in our community will be converted because you're living this out. Because of you. It's not because of the leader or the preacher or the person on staff. This is why I love what we've done as mission groups and what we've put together. This is why I think it's so powerful because it's ran by the disciples. And here's what I think is interesting. When disciples aren't engaging in these spaces, when we're not connecting in these areas, it just shows that we've adopted the wrong mindset towards church. We just show up. It's just a show. And we're not engaged in the mission. I love creating spaces that are ran by the people. And y'all know this. If you've been in MRSA long enough, you know what I'm eventually going to do. People can't even become members of MRSA without getting tapped. You know what I mean? All I have to do. Because so, in my mind, I'm like, what? The church is ran by us. It's a team. I always see people leave church when they feel like I, I'm just showing up to a show. I'm just showing up to a show. And I ain't that cocky to think I'm that good of a preacher. Right, Horatio? He tells me every week, I'm not that good. <laughs> you know, I'm just playing. I'm playing. That's a joke, guys. Y'all can laugh. It's okay. He doesn't say that all the time. <laughs> you know? And this is what inspires me. It inspires me. I mean, look, we, we, have, we started our first Latin Bible talk. And who's leading that? Young Christians. Jeff and Christina. Young Christians just came into the ministry. You know what I mean? People stepping in, doing these different things. This is young, and we just have these young people coming in, different people coming in. It's like, let's do something. How can we get involved? How can we get engaged? All young and old, it's like, what, what do you see as a need, and how can you serve? That's the church. Brothers coming up and preaching. As you know, I'm like, I don't, I'm, I don't hog the pulpit. Who's preaching next? We're gonna, and why? Because I think it's important for us to grow in that skill. It's not just me. My final point that we're gonna examine in the life of Stephen before we break out into our mission groups and have some discussions on this topic is this. And this might be the most difficult point in the life of Stephen. Sometime God's will for our lives and for us is to be a martyr. Is to be a martyr. 
And this is the part I don't think people want to hold on to. You know, Stephen did everything right. Everything right. Right? He's, he's, I mean, we, we spent the whole month and a half examining his story. He loved people. He served people. There was no ego involved. He was clearly intelligent and knew the word of God at a high level, but was humble enough to do what? Wait tables. Serve. At that capacity, he did everything right, and he died. Not just died, he was murdered. Not just murdered, it was brutal. It was brutal. What happened to him? Why didn't God bless him? Why didn't God reward him with a growing ministry and everything working out the way he intended? Why didn't God multiply his days? He was so faithful. I don't know. But Acts 7, verse 58, it says, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul watched as each stone smashed into Stephen's face. And his body was mangled into a bloody heap. They heard Stephen please for God to forgive them while they attacked him. Saul saw the glory of God reflected on Stephen's face after all of that. And that affected him. Stephen's blood going on to the ground was the seed that helped convert the apostle Saul. Isn't that interesting? What does that say for us? What does that say about us? Stephen's most effective contribution to the kingdom of God came through his martyrdom. Paul was not converted by seeing Stephen be delivered. He wasn't converted by seeing Stephen being delivered. He wasn't converted by seeing Stephen full of the Holy Spirit and, and being blessed and being rich and being successful. That, that, that wasn't it. I'm not saying that that's, those are bad things, but I'm just saying let's, let's put this stuff into perspective here. He was converted by seeing a man full of the Holy Spirit testify to Jesus and the glory of Jesus in the midst of pain. And I really want y'all to understand this. That the sermon you preach through your pain is louder than the ones you preach through your blessings. And this is, this is, this is big, guys. I don't think we understand how God works through our pain. Because we want, we love, I need to stop on the social media thing. I think I've been beating it up a lot the past few weeks. Okay, Corey says I got to keep going. All right, so I'm going to keep going on the social media thing. Man, we get on that bad boy and we love the glitz and glam of what it looks like. We admire the lifestyles that we see. The stories of how God has blessed people to be this and that, to do all this stuff most powerful sermon is to see you overcome and stay committed in the midst of trial and tribulation. Stay the course. Stay faithful. From start to finish, Stephen's life screamed the very first thing that I started off talking about Stephen. And I said that his life screamed that is not about who. It's not about me. That was his life. It's not about me. It's not about my self-actualization or getting the respect I deserve. It's about serving and waiting tables if that's the need. It's not about me obtaining blessings and walking in my prosperity. It's about directing people's attention towards Jesus. It's not about selfless attitude that's infectious that everyone believes right now. It's about I live a selfless life in a selfish world to point people to God. We're more concerned with being accepted versus standing out. 
And it, it, it frustrates me, man. It frustrates me. To go on and see everyone, they want to, people just want to be that person so bad. And I'm like, rather than try to show off how smart you are, how wise you are, how you see the world so much better and so different than everyone else. Go out and love somebody. Serve some people. Connect with people. Uplift people. To share testimonies of that. Man, I feel like the world would be such a better place. We live in a different world now. And it's getting harder. Where does Stephen get this courage to be so selfless and so courageous? What do y'all think inspires Stephen to have this type of mindset? I'm asking. I see some hands. Y'all go ahead. Where y'all? No? No? She said, God. No! You right, baby girl, you right! <laughs> From the mouth of babes. Amen. I don't even know if I want to let anyone else speak after that one. I'm just going to continue on with the point. Because <laughs> you're right. When he looked up into heaven, who did he see? There you go. <laughs> Y'all better give that little baby a round of applause. Y'all acting all shy. <laughs> This is big. And I feel like we're not looking up enough. We're not looking up enough. You know who we're looking at? Each other. You know who we're looking at? And that's, and that's all the words and all the actions, all the posts, all the engagement. It's all people-centered. It's not taking people's eyes and lifting them high. This is big. He saw Jesus, his arms stretched out, his helpless arms stretched out, receiving him. This is huge. Jesus is washing the feet of sinners. Jesus told people to forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus served tables. includes all those little details that, that he talked about in his vision. He saw Jesus standing. I think that is so powerful. And that affirmation. My thing is this, church. Are you ready to stand up for something? Because right now, there's a lot not to stand up for. Right now. There's a lot to hide. There's a lot to avoid. You know, we're seeing some stuff in culture that's crazy. And the same way you see me get up, and I got no problem talking about on Juneteenth, how race is something that we should have never been afraid to talk about a long time ago, and condemning that in our society. That same energy we got to put towards things like abortion. And I know that's a topic. There's topics in society where we don't want to touch with, the, with, the, with, with nothing. We want to avoid it. And I keep challenging people. When you're so caught up in culture, when your identity is so tied into this earth, you forget what God has called you to. You forget to value and talk about the things that God values and talks about. And I'll see more disciples get on all these faces and be evangelistic towards topics that are had nothing to do with God, but because they want to engage a world conversation. I think you need to challenge yourself on who you're looking at. And I think we need to have an honest conversation. 
And this topic of abortion is something I think we need to have more conversations on as disciples. What does this look like? How do we talk about this? How do we engage it? Because what I've noticed now, and y'all know, and I've talked about this, I don't like when Christians like to run around, Christians in 2020, this age of Christianity, like to run around and talk about how persecuted they are. We're so persecuted. We're so, everyone's coming at us. None of us have gotten stoned. None of us have gotten stoned. So I just put it into perspective when you talk about your persecution, all right? But I ain't going to lie. It ain't like things could start becoming something. Because right now, your opinion will get you. <laughs> and I ain't going to let, let's not act like that ain't real. Your opinion could get you in trouble. We've watched this off. Matter of fact, your opinion from 30 years ago can get you in trouble. Right? So let's so it is what it is, right? It is what it is. But hear, hear me now. Hear me now. Every disciple, even if you want to get you, you up in arms because I'm talking about abortion like this, hear me now. You will be held accountable to God. Scratch these cats on online and your bosses and all these other places. You will be held accountable to God for your opinions and the opinions you evangelize. And if you believe in God, forget if you believe in the way people interpret the Bible and the way people do da 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 da. If you believe in God, understand this: the opinions of man will fade. The opinions of man will change. We're undergoing a time of transformation of opinions and everything. It changes, guys. God has not changed. It has been very consistent how we've interpreted God has changed because we tend to follow who? Culture, not God. Not God. And here's why we're not going to see Stevens in our day and age. This is why we're not going to see Stevens now because you're more afraid of what culture says than God. I want to see more Stevens. I want to be a Steven. I want to be a Steven. But you know what you, you know, you know what that when you say I want to be? Remember I talked about how come I, I hesitate with singing some worship songs? Remember, remember I mentioned I was like, I, I don't just sing every worship song. You, you, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's one of them. I'm like, y'all know what y'all say. I want to be tried by, by. <laughs> yeah. I gotta wait, think twice about that, bad boy. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. You want to be tried by fire? God's like, heard. <laughs> Say less. <laughs> you better be careful of what you say. I want to see more Stevens. Because you know what Stevens produced? Man, we're here today. They produce Saul's. They produce Paul's. They changed the world. I know it's hard, church. I know it's hard. But this church ain't built on me. This church ain't even built on you. This church is built on who? And if we gonna say that, then let's act like it. Like for real, let's act like it. Act like you are a part of Jesus' movement. Act like your priorities align with the things that Jesus aligned himself with. Talk like that. Stop trying to sound like the world. Stop trying to sound like your friends. Stop trying to sound like that warped version of Christianity that you've been taught. Go to the Bible. Go to the Bible. Let that challenge you. And here's what's going to happen. You might get stoned. I wish it was something else. But this is the world we're in. Right? I know that's like, no, Paris, you got to sell it, right? You got to sell it. Make it sound good. I don't, I can't. I, I can't. Even Jesus got killed, man. I can't. What, what can we do? If we're so afraid of being hurt, this ain't the faith for you. This is not the faith for you. It's a new day and age, church. I pray that our numbers grow, but it's only going to grow if we stop acting like society and start acting like Stephen. So 
Lord, as we get ready to take your communion, I pray that we take it with all respect. Remembering that we're taking a communion that's called to remind us not just of your power, your majesty, your glory, but it's called to remind us of your suffering. Communion was always meant to be a call to remind us that we're not here to pursue glory. We're not here to pursue comfort. We're not here to pursue acceptance. We're here to reflect your son. I pray that we take your communion with the respect it deserves. And as we take it, that we examine ourselves. Am I striving to be more like you? For real. Am I striving to be more like the person I see in your gospels? Not to live up to church culture. Not to live up to the political and social ideologies of our time. But to really imitate you. Because if we are doing that in its purest form, then we should accept the heat and all the smoke that comes with it. Lord, I thank you that at the end of the day, we're not, we're not fighting for an earthly crown, but a heavenly one. That we understand that our lives have intention and purpose I pray that we can live up and rise up to that occasion. That we don't see church as a place to be served, but the place to serve. That we don't see this world as a place to survive in, but a place that we can have opportunity to help change. Use us, Lord. Help this church to be more like your son. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.